Well, thank you for this opportunity to speak with you. And uh, I think Alma has done a great job of um, providing uh, background uh, on these issues. I wanted to pick up on, uh, uh, as Alma said, on one of the issues that she raised, which is this issue of uh, ownership of the research outputs of the universities, who owns the research outputs, in particular the written results of research uh, uh, at, uh, in the universities. And um, when I talk about uh, uh, ownership, um, I guess we should construe this as who has what rights with respect to the research outputs. And in keeping with the goals that Alma uh, spoke about at the beginning of her comments, how can we maximize the rights that the general public has to these research outputs? How can we maximize the commons? So as background to this discussion, I want to talk about what motivates academics. Uh, I'll mention three things. Of course, there are many things that motivate academics to do what they do. But I'll, I'll mention three things uh, that certainly uh, motivate academics. First of all, certainly curiosity is one. Curiosity, which leads to an insatiable urge to learn and discover. Curiosity is often uh, the thing that leads people to become uh, academics in the first place. That's what leads to the research generating outputs in the first place. Second of all, what motivates academics uh, is vanity. Curiosity without vanity leads to a kind of monastic scholarship of the, uh, the, of the sort that we saw in the early history of the university that Charles Nesson alluded to. But vanity leads academics to actually want to distribute their knowledge to their own credit, and also, as it happens, to the greater knowledge of society. So vanity is a second uh, motivator. And the third, which I won't talk about at the moment, but I'll come back to later, uh, motivating uh, academics, uh, is laziness. So, sir, uh, so curiosity, vanity, and laziness. And I'll mention not necessarily in that order. So the good news is that in the case of university research, the, um, the ownership of the research outputs start out with actors who are both curious and vain. This means that in general, academics have interest in generating knowledge and in distributing it, in part to their own greater glory, that is, in maximizing the commons. So that's, um, uh, that's good, that the rights, the ownership of the knowledge starts with actors who have that greater good in mind, uh, if sometimes uh, altruistically, but sometimes only accidentally. But either way, it's a good thing. Well, let's talk about how, I want to talk about how that ownership, uh, those ownership issues uh, change as they go through the normal process of rights transference. And again, as I said, I'll concentrate on, on, um, on how this works with respect to published research results, typically in, in, in articles, peer-reviewed articles. If people are interested, we can talk about other aspects, uh, what happens with data, with physical research materials, software, and the like, which presents somewhat different issues. Now, as Alma said, in the days of print, um, uh, the public couldn't access these results, hence uh, uh, couldn't exercise these rights, uh, the, the, sorry, the researchers couldn't access or exercise these rights without expensive printing and distribution, which was provided for by third parties that had special expertise and capital. And these overheads uh, were paid, uh, paid for through limiting access to those who were willing to pay through subscriptions. In order to distribute the research results, publishers needed rights to do that, which they received from the author, uh, typically uh, through um, uh, a transfer of copyright. But, the, but the, um, uh, the rights started with the author. So in this little diagram, which I promise will get a little bit bigger in a moment, that depicts the state of play when the author own, owns the rights. So this little A for author, the dark gray indicating uh, that that's where the rights are sitting. There is a technical question I'll mention very briefly about uh, why it is that authors have rights to the uh, articles that they publish. Why do they have copyright in articles uh, that they publish when they're working for a university that employs them to write these very articles? Uh, wouldn't the university 
own the rights to the articles. Well, um, it's, uh, I'm not a lawyer. There are many uh, in the audience who are much more qualified than I to answer this question. My understanding is that by convention, there's an exception uh, in, uh, uh, in copyright uh, that um, uh, essentially exempts authors from work for hire uh, conditions so that, uh, 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 sorry, uh, exempts uh, uh, teachers from work for hire conditions so that they own uh, rights in their research uh, papers. It's not clear whether the exemption is one in which copyright vests with the author or copyright vests instead with the university, which immediately transfers it to the author. I'm not sure uh, that there are any, there's any great import to the distinction. One way or the other, uh, upon uh, writing these articles, the author receives the rights. But eventually, the author uh, uh, transfers these rights, uh, typically through a copyright transfer, to a publisher. And here in the diagram, P is the publisher. The author, through a copyright transfer, uh, gives the rights to the publisher. Now, the publisher has the rights, and the author, in general, does not. And here's an example of uh, such a um, uh, copyright agreement. It says uh, that the undersigned transfers to the extent that there is copyright to be transferred, the exclusive copyright interest in the cited manuscript, et cetera, et cetera, to the American Chemical Society. This happens to be language from the American Chemical Society's uh, copyright agreement. So now, uh, in return for um, the publisher publishing the article, the author has transferred those rights and given them up to a different actor, a publisher. Now, in general, also, these copyright agreements may have some, uh, some um, uh, retention of rights for the author. Here, it's the part following the phrase, subject to the following. So the publisher may, in effect, transfer back rights to the author, some, some rights may be retained in the case of the American Chemical Society. The pertinent right here is that the undersigned author, let's see, uh, can um, uh, revise the paper, can distribute it to not more than 50 colleagues, uh, as provided that appropriate credit is given to the American Chemical Society. So the author does retain these small number of limited rights. Uh, by virtue of being, having them transferred back to the publisher. Here's another example from, uh, from uh, another publisher, the Nature Publishing Group. Similar kind of situation. They don't call it a copyright transfer. They call it an exclusive license, but it amounts to much the same thing. Nature Publishing Group acquires uh, the exclusive license to publish, reproduce, distribute, display, store uh, the contribution, to translate it into other languages, to create derivative works, and so forth. But again, the authors retain certain non-exclusive rights, namely to post a copy on the author's own website or institutional repository six months after publication. So it's the same kind of uh, process going on. We start with the rights in the hands of the author who uh, has interest in making them as broadly available as possible, but then they're immediately transferred, not immediately, they're transferred uh, at a certain point to a publisher who immediately provides some uh, limited rights uh, retention at the publisher's, um, at the publisher's uh, interest. So this happens over and over and over again, uh, over many different articles. And uh, the end result is uh, the rights starting with the authors, but in the end, the authors have very limited rights, just those that the publishers allow them to retain. Every once in a while, an author will um, engage in negotiation with a publisher to, uh, to retain more rights. I've done this uh, more or less uh, uniformly over the last, uh, oh, I don't know, 15 years or so. Uh, and a few other people I know of do this kind of thing. It's not a very pleasant thing to have to do, but it does allow you often to retain much larger rights. So I've represented that by this case in the middle where the author, in addition to granting appropriate rights to the publisher, also by virtue of negotiating and managing the uh, copyright agreement and some back and forth with the publisher, also makes sure that the author has uh, um, broad rights as well. So this brings me to the topic of laziness. Um, 
laziness affects this process in two ways. First, um, this rights negotiation, article by article, requires effort. And anything that requires effort is unlikely to be taken up wholesale by academics who are a little bit lazy. So it's quite rare. So that's why, in general, you see in this little diagram, more or less, in, in, in all the cases, the rights retention is very limited. Only in the occasional uh, case do you see large rights retention. The second place where it becomes pertinent is in taking advantage of these retained rights, uh, even the ones that uh, are retained by default. Taking advantage of those retained rights also requires effort, not very much effort, but a little bit. It requires, um, say, a deposit of the article into uh, an open repository that an, an institution might run. And consequently, um, to the extent that academics are lazy, they aren't going to go through that effort uh, uh, in general. So even to the extent that rights are retained, as in the diagram, we may not see them being taken advantage of as fully as they might. Well, so um, um, I want to turn to what can be done in a practical sense about these practical problems with ownership and rights retention. In particular, these two issues of um, the problem of rights negotiation and of uh, obtaining of, uh, uh, of actual distribution uh, with respect to whatever rights happen to be maintained, uh, retained. Well, the first, I'll talk, and I'll talk about the latter first. How can, we, uh, how can we get around the laziness of faculty to actually deposit their works? One proposal to mitigate this second problem is a kind of policy that requires deposit, a, a deposit mandate. And um, various uh, uh, people have proposed this kind of solution, uh, most notably uh, Stephen Harnad. Uh, and it seems like a quite good idea to me. Uh, it has, has, doesn't affect ownership or rights in any way. It just says that, uh, that uh, members of the academic community who are subject to this uh, policy must deposit into their local institutional repository a copy of their final manuscript so that whatever rights happen to be retained can actually be made use of. So it's a, it's a simple kind of policy. And to the extent that a mandate on faculty is effective in actually engaging change in their behavior, uh, it could be useful. I think um, it's safe to say that the extent to which this actually causes changes in behavior uh, probably varies among institutions. Uh, certainly in some cases, it's been very effective. In others, perhaps not so much. Um, but it's worth, uh, it's worth trying. So that's a deposit mandate to mitigate uh, this problem of at least being able to take advantage of whatever rights are retained. But there's still this problem that the, the rights that are retained are limited and they're dependent on the good graces of publishers whose interests aren't the same as the authors who generated the content in the first place or the universities where they work. So what to do about this second problem? About this, it was actually the first problem, retaining broader rights in interactions with publishers despite the laziness of academics. Well, so this is a different kind of policy, a rights retention open access policy. And the way it works is by getting a faculty to um, make an overt uh, statement granting a third party uh, some rights. The idea is, and here's a, here's a kind of uh, a statement of, of the, core, uh, the core clause in the policy, that each faculty member grants to their university permission to make available their scholarly articles and to exercise the copyright in those articles. So the university becomes uh, a kind of a convenient third party to temporarily hold these rights on behalf of the author. 
So what happens if we have this policy in force at a university? Well, this policy by itself is a grant of rights. It's a non-exclusive license from an author now to a university as depicted by this little arrow at the top. So the author, uh, the moment copyright vests in the article, from the moment of its creation, the author grants a license to uh, the university. And the wording here is crucial in the policy. It doesn't say each faculty member will grant to the university, which would require later that the faculty member actually do grant. No, it says each faculty member grants. This is the grant. The policy is the grant of the license, which means that the, the grant happens at the moment copyright vests in the article. And therefore, it comes before the later transfer of the copyright, if any, to a publisher. So there's a non-exclusive license prior to the copyright transfer. The university uh, then holds a non-exclusive license independent of what the arrangement is with the publisher and can make use of that in various ways. In particular, can transfer those rights back to the author, as I've depicted here in the diagram. So the author, instead of retaining limited rights by virtue of the university's grant to the author, can retain broad rights. The university has rights to distribute broadly as well, so that if the article is in the university's uh, repository, it can be distributed quite broadly. In fact, all of copyright can be exercised in those articles, subject to whatever limitations the university wants to place on itself or the policy places on the university. Uh, for instance, the um, version of this policy, which is now in place at various schools, now five schools at Harvard University, uh, places a non-commercial limitation on the exercise of copyright by the university, which seems reasonable to me. Now, um, we always want this kind of policy to work in the interest of the faculty members uh, who, uh, at the university who have enacted it on their own collective behalf, and to make sure that that's true, to make sure that the faculty members always have a free choice in the matter of what rights they grant, uh, we put in a, uh, a waiver uh, provision that says that the university will waive application of the license for a particular article whenever a faculty member asks for that waiver to occur. At the sole discretion of the author. So if for any reason an author doesn't want the university to have this license, uh, uh, he or she can obtain a waiver. And just for good measure, we can put in a deposit mandate as well that each faculty member provides a copy of the author's final version uh, for uh, distribution from the institutional repository. So what's the effect of this kind of uh, policy? Well, now we have, in general, quite a different uh, configuration. We have... Uh, uh, the university, in general, grant, uh, being granted a license, broad rights uh, of distribution and use for all of the articles written by a, a group of faculty. With an occasional exception, when a waiver is requested, as in this, one of these cases in this diagram, I've depicted the, the dashed, uh, dashed line showing that a waiver was granted, uh, was requested by an author, then the university doesn't receive rights, and then the author can't get them back, the publisher will govern what rights the author retains in that case. So that's the distinction between these two policies. In one case, uh, authors retain whatever rights publishers happen to allow uh, unless some uh, overt rights negotiation takes place, whereas under a rights retention open access policy, by default, there are very broad rights unless an explicit waiver is uh, generated. Let me mention a few properties of these two policies, uh, some distinctions between them. Well, we'll start with choice. This is not a distinction between them. In, in, in both cases, the policies, uh, status quo policy uh, of uh, performing rights retention according to what a publisher allows, and a rights retention OA policy, in both cases, authors have free choice as to how they want to manage their uh, their retained rights. You can freely choose under the status quo to negotiate with a publisher to retain broader rights, 
you can freely choose to get a waiver of the uh, license to the university in the case of the rights retention policy. So you have free choice as to whether or not uh, rights are retained in both of these policies. Under the status quo policy, the rights in general are governed by the publisher. Under a rights retention policy, they're governed by an institution that is to say by a collective of academics uh, like the authors themselves. Under the status quo, if publishers decide to reduce the uh, retained rights, as there are now beginning to be some signs that they are, then the uh, rights retention is subject to that kind of retrenchment of retained rights on the part of publishers. Under a rights retention open access policy, uh, the uh, retained rights are subject to uh, uh, systematic pushback from publishers. If publishers decide systematically that in order to publish articles from an institution with such a policy, they, require, uh, they will require that the authors get waivers of these kinds of licenses, then in general the authors will get those waivers. Authors are loath to uh, enter into uh, these kinds of uh, arguments with publishers. So the uh, amount of rights retention is subject to systematic publisher pu pushback. Importantly, in the case of the status quo, expanding rights retention requires many individual negotiations by many individual and basically lazy academics. And under a rights retention open access policy, broad rights retention requires only a single vote at one moment in time by a group of essentially lazy academics. So if you're trying to deal with lazy academics, better to try to get them to do one thing once than lots of things many, many times over. Um, the status quo fails in retaining rights in the face of faculty inaction. If faculty don't do anything, then no, then no broader rights are retained. Under a rights retention open access policy, faculty inaction is an optimal course of events. Once the policy is in force, if faculty do nothing, they've retained rights. Only if they take an overt act to uh, uh, direct that a waiver of the license be granted do uh, the rights get reduced. So I've described this kind of rights retention open access policy with three parts, a permission part, non-exclusive license to a university, a waiver part, open waiver for any reason at the sole discretion of the author, and a deposit part that the author is required to provide a copy of the article as a kind of an abstract notion, but of course it isn't an abstract notion. It's been implemented in various universities in the United States. I don't know of any in Europe that have taken this approach, although I should say that many uh, in Europe have taken at least the deposit mandate approach, uh, which also is a valid and valuable uh, approach to uh, an open access policy. Here's a list of, uh, 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 of uh, universities uh, and faculties that have uh, this kind of um, policy. Uh, the first was uh, voted by the Faculty of Arts and Sciences uh, unanimously on February 12th of 2008. So we now have a couple of years experience, over, over two years of experience with, with this um, policy uh, at Harvard. Uh, and now five, uh, five uh, schools at Harvard have passed these policies, including the law school, the government school, the ed school, education school, and the business school. It's also been passed at other universities, including Stanford, MIT, University of Kansas, uh, smaller colleges such as Oberlin, individual departments, uh, in some places. Uh, so um, beginning to be a few places that have instituted these policies. And the nice thing about the policies, these policies this is that every university that passes this policy gets the benefit in terms of rights retention immediately. That doesn't depend on other universities also passing the policy. So I'll mention some of the, just briefly, some of the reactions to the policy. Uh, uh, our local newspaper, the Boston Globe, uh, called the initial um, Faculty of Arts and Sciences vote a bold move to boost the unrestricted global use of research articles. You can since I'm the speaker, I get to pick the quotes about the policy that you get to see. Um, 
But it wasn't just in Boston that we got good, uh, uh, good press. Here in Italy, we got a, uh, a statement from the Italian uh, Corriere della Sera that uh, the Harvard decision will accelerate the ongoing process of reorganizing the means by which knowledge is disseminated. I may have, that's, I, don't, I apologize if I mistranslated that. If that's not what it says, that's what it should have said. Now, I, in, in all fairness, I have to give uh, equal time, I suppose, to less positive reviews of this idea. Here's the Association of American Publishers who said that this is a vendor-customer dispute over price. It doesn't surprise us that all libraries feel their budgets are far less than desirable. But that's a reality the educational community faces. So, of course, when the AAP says that budgets are far less than desirable, what they mean by desirable is what would be desirable from the point of view of the AAP. And then finally, here's, the, uh, here's a, a comment from Inside Higher Education. Harvard's self-serving move weakens standards of peer review processes. Now, this shows a complete misunderstanding of the policy. It has nothing to do with peer review policies. It has uh, processes. All of the articles that we're talking about that are being subject to rights retention are still going to publishers through the normal peer review process. They were accepted for publication based on peer review, and uh, all the normal processes are followed. It's just that the author's manuscripts have broad rights retention because of the policy. And then they go on to say that the policy presumes that any garbage Harvard profs write would have been worthy of publication. Yeah, let's hear it for that. <laughs> so, so this part is actually true, but it's irrelevant to the policy. Um, I'll raise some issues. Uh, um, I'll, I'll raise some issues here. Um, very briefly, and I won't go into detail if people want to ask questions about them, I'm happy to talk further. There have been worries about this kind of policy. Doesn't it restrict my academic freedom? Will this damage junior faculty's careers? Will this drive publishers out of business or kill scholarly societies or, as seems to be implied in that last Inside Higher Ed quote, and peer review? And the answers in, in general are no, uh, it, it doesn't. And the crucial point here is that no article need ever have its publication affected in any way because of this policy. It's because of the waiver provision of the policy, if for no other reason. You can always get a waiver of the policy and revert the situation of that article to the status quo. And finally, I'll mention the policy in practice uh, uh, that people may wonder about. We, we now have experience with the policy. We've, we've been working with the policy for two years. We understand how it works and how to deal with it. And we know now that causing this kind of policy to be in effect at a university doesn't cause the sky to fall. Uh, the, the whole uh, world of scholarly communication doesn't end just because a university passes this kind of policy. Um, because I've run over my time already, I'll, I'll stop here. If people are interested in these kinds of questions, publisher reaction and whether articles do what just are there just waivers being generated for all the articles, those kinds of things, I'm happy to talk to them if there's time for questions. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much.